Good morning, everybody. How is everybody this beautiful day? Good? Beautiful? I don't know, Larry. Have you seen yourself? <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> exactly. Oh, my goodness. It's good to see Brother Jesse back. We missed him. He hasn't been here for a while. I'm glad to see him. He's not even listening. He's too busy talking. That's okay. That's fine. Good to see you, Brother Jesse. Good to have you here. We are glad that you guys came here this morning. This morning? It is the morning, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Woo! It is still this morning. We're glad you're here this morning. Let's all stand. We'll begin singing. When the roll is called up yonder. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more And the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder When the roll called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder i'll be there on that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in christ shall rise come on keep singing when his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called up yonder i'll be there when the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. I had to catch my breath. It was hard, you know. <laughs> Whew. Anyway. Yeah, if I stop singing or fall over, just keep singing, okay? <laughs> just keep on going. <laughs> oh, the next song is When We All Get to Heaven. Got a little theme going on this morning. Have you noticed? Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace in the mansions bright and blessed and He'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory while we walk the pilgrim pathway. Clouds will overspread the sky, but when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. It's a beautiful June day, and the heat's coming, and hopefully, um, I saw the weatherman. He said it's going to rain. Oh, not much today, but maybe a little bit tomorrow and a little bit more later. We need the rain. And uh, so we're happy about that. A couple different things on our announcements. Um, we're going to be starting Grief Share again. And that's going to start June 22nd, 5 to 7 p.m. Um, in the, um, uh, right over here in the library. And um, so if you would like to be part of that, uh, if you know someone who may need that, uh, we'll be doing that. And uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. We're going to be glad to send you some back. On uh, the 27th, the end of this month, we're going to take up a special offering for um, 
partnering with Champs Missions, a uh, missionary Rick Kiesler, to build a medical clinic in, the, um, and I cannot pronounce that word, I will not say a word Fernando when I meet him. Uh, let's see, Cien Perigo. Tell me how to say, say that, Miss Lydia. Okay, I, can, I never can't break up all those those uh, uh, syllables right. I think in English, and I don't even do that well. But um, listen, this is a very needy area, and uh, he's trying to raise eighty thousand dollars to build this building. He has commitment from the government to staff it. Um, and we want to be part of that. So what I want you to do is I thought, well, you know, $2,000 is really reasonable. That would be, um, that would be, that would cover, oh, let's see, a hundred adults at $20 or a hundred people at $20. So we can raise $2,000. And if we want to go over that, we will definitely be able to do that. So we're going to take up that offering at the end of the month. I'm, I personally am going to do more than $20 in my time with this. Because um, I have a burden for that. Um, mission. Not only are we going to help people physically there, we're going to help them spiritually. There is going to be a training center for, plan- for church planners, and everyone will be getting the gospel witness at that time. You see, if we don't do everything within with some sort of gospel witness, then we're just not helping, really. Um, every person that comes through our food pantry out here gets prayed with and gets something either a Jesus movie or a booklet or a track, something that points them to Jesus. And by the way, I better, before I forget, just to thank you. I want to thank you, first of all, for bringing so much food. Let me tell you, we're getting 145 to 160 salmon a week. And everything you can give to us helps. We, we are getting stuff through the food bank and, and other things. And, and what we get is a lot of and we had a pallet of candy. And I did snag, snag a couple candy bars. but um, And I did snag some M&Ms for my wife. And, uh, but, um, and I'm sure there's some others that snag some things too. But we, we, we want to supplement that with some other things. So if you guys can continue to do that, just think about it when you're at the store. Just grab a couple something extra, um, whatever you can do, and understand we're making a difference. And again, not just with the food. That's a that's a venue to get the gospel to people. Um, so there we go. We got those two off those two announcements. Other than that, it's summertime. We're gearing up for youth camp and a few other things. So just keep those things in prayer. This morning, though, we have a couple special things to do. Um, Emily, why don't you come up here? And, and Eric, you too. Emily and Eric have uh, graduated high school. Yeah. So I'll say, there you are. Look at him. <laughs> that young ring stuff has gone a long way, huh? <laughs> Wearing camo. Okay. We have a we have a tradition here at Trinity. Uh, so we, <laughs> I'm thinking about that because there's a couple other things going on in my world that's going to affect that. Um, here at Sunshine, um, we give a Bible study, a Bible study, and I would have done it last week, but I did not come in in time, and do you know there's not Christian bookstores anymore that you can go get them and you have a gun? You have to order it online. So, you have now have, what's that thing you have there? Yeah, there you go. Okay, you got that one. And Eric? Come on, buddy, I want to see you. Congratulate them. I think God has big things for both of them. And uh, they've been a great blessing to us. Mark and Emily, if you're watching this, don't know. Um, but they're going to love you to death. So, Come on, Blake. Blake is uh, our new youth pastor. Um, he is also has just graduated from Trinity Baptist College. Those that happen to know him. Yeah. Those of you who work in uh, children's ministry, can I tell you that this and those kids back there are products of what you've done? So the, these are the very foundations of working in our, with our kids. Those of you young men like young women like Jim, Junior, young men like 
away from the Deputy Department of Human Services and come back to it on May 16th. And we're very excited. Blake, you didn't get the same Bible. You have gotten uh, a study Bible called the Open Bible. Um, the reason I got it is one of my favorite Bibles, the study Bible. My wife, when we were dating, got me one too. And not long before we got married, I wanted to pass it on. If to you, I know you'll use it well. Let's all stand again. Sweet by and by. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. To our bountiful Father above, we will offer our tribute of praise. For the glorious gift of his love and the blessings that hallow our days in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful shore next song we're going to sing is how great is our God our God is great amen we serve a risen Savior and I'm so glad that we have a great God to serve and that he loves us and cares for each and every one of us so let's sing about how great our God is this morning the splendor of the King clothed in majesty let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How great is our God! Sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. And age to age he stands, and time is in his hands, beginning and the end. Beginning and the end, the Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God! Sing with me, how great our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God, how great is our God, sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great our God. Let's pray this morning. Lord, we thank you that you are a great God and you care for each and every one of us. Lord, I thank you so much for the power, the awesome power that you have 
And Lord, I just pray that you would be with us today, Lord. I pray that you would help the pastor now as he comes and, and gives us the message for today, Lord. I pray that you would help us to pay attention attentively to what you have for us today. Help us to absorb what, what you would have and to leave here changed, Lord, a different person. I pray that you would just be with us today. Give us a good day. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Amen. I so appreciate Corey and Jess. By the way, they're products of, of children's ministry and youth ministry, and now they're serving in, uh, in Taiwan and here helping us. It just, it's really great to have that bass and the piano. And, and if any of y'all play piano, we'd love to have you come play for us because when they have to go back, on deputa uh, back to raise some more money and they have to go, and, uh, go back to Taiwan to uh, be a witness there, um, they're gonna need, we're going to need a piano player again. So just uh, if you play, just let us know. We can, we'll put you in. Um, turn your Bibles, if you will, to Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. We are kind of wrapping up. There's only a few more messages in Mark. Um, probably we'll end this month. Uh, uh, the, we'll end what we have done in Mark. Because see, at Easter, I kind of covered in Mark the Easter story. But we got a few more things that moved up to that Easter story. We're in the last week. Um, Jesus is doing the last things uh, before his arrest and crucifixion. And he is teaching and, and uh, preparing people and, and, and giving that really those last instructions, not only to his disciples, but trying to impact the Jewish religion, the religious leaders, and help them to understand what's going on. He really he has compassion and love for them. And, and, and they're just not getting it. So we're going to break through these verses. It's going, we're going to be verse 35 to 44. I'm not going to read it all at once. We'll just break it into the sections, and then we'll, we'll dig in a little bit. So first things, the, the, the question is, who is the Son of God? Now, Jesus had just finished answering a bunch of questions from people, and he kind of shut them down because, well, he brought them to this point, and they just didn't, they couldn't answer they, their hypocrisy was being exposed, and they couldn't, they, 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 they shut down. You ever, you ever have that? You ever get in kind of a um, debate with somebody? I'm not going to say argument. Let's talk a, a, a debate. And you get to that place where you shut them down. I love to do that. I hate it when it happens to me. See, Jesus was all right, and he had shut the, that debate down. Now he's going to try to instruct them. Verse 35, And Jesus answered and said while he taught in the temple, How say the scribes that Christ is the son of David? For David himself said, By the Holy Ghost, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore calleth him Lord, and whence is he? Than his son. And the common people heard him gladly. Let me give you a couple things here before we actually dig into what Jesus is saying. He's actually quoting a psalm, and, and he is also explaining to them what the Messiah and who the Messiah is. But I noticed one little thing at the last of that said, Look at the common people heard him. I think one of the troubling things today is that maybe we're, we're not common enough to hear him. The religious leaders of that day, the people who should have known, the scribes, uh, the Pharisees, um, uh, the priest, all the le leadership that was supposed to run this, this religious organization, that were supposed to carry on all the commands that, that had been given in the Old Testament for, for Israel to be a very special people and to point people to God, they had messed it all up. And they wouldn't listen to him. But the common people, they heard him. I think we have some of that today. Let's not educate ourselves so much that we cannot see Jesus when he comes. Let's not allow traditions to mess us up. So, Jesus, in this question, he exposed these religious leaders. He, he exposed them as ignorant of what the Old Testament taught about the nature of the Messiah. He, he showed them as inept as teachers. Um, he just exposed 
that they, they really didn't know what they're talking about. The Old Testament, the Hebrew word um, in the Old Testament, Christ, the, that's the Hebrew word Messiah, which means anointed one. It refers to the king whom God had promised. So let me understand. Let me help you understand. Um, Christ is not Jesus' last name. That's his title. He's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. Now, what was Jesus' last name? Probably in Jewish tradition, tradition it would have been Jesus bar Joseph. Jesus, the son of Joseph. But we know that he was Jesus, the Messiah, the son of the living God. So he is starting to explain some of these things. David uh, said by the Holy Spirit that, 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 that uh, I will sit down at his feet, at the Messiah's feet. So how could that happen? This is a very, very important question. One is enemies, just they wouldn't even ask him this. For if we are wrong about Jesus, listen, if we are wrong about who Jesus is, who the Christ is, then, then we're wrong about salvation. This is so important. Jesus quoted Psalms. And the only way David's son could also be David's Lord would be if the Messiah were um, God come in human flesh? The answer, of course, is Jesus is God in human flesh. That's what we celebrate at Christmas, right? We celebrate the fact that, that God manifested through a Virgin Mary. He was born into this world to become the Savior of this world, the Lord of this world. That's who Jesus is. He is the Messiah. He is God. You can never, ever forget that. This next section, though, Jesus starts warning people. I love this. He says, but where are the scribes? Verse 38, and he said unto them in his doctrine, beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and the uppermost rooms at feast, which devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayers. These shall receive greater damnation. Wow. He says, beware, to watch out for. It, it guard against the evil influence of the scribes. These guys, man, they loved the attention. They wore the, the finest robes. And they wanted to, to, to sit in the, the, the best seats. They, they, oh, man, they went in long, long prayers. Really not really praying to God, but they just look at me. Isn't that a problem we have today? This look at me stuff. And, and, and these scribes, they, they were the religious leaders. Look at me. Look at the airplanes that I own and fly. Look at the look at the, the the size of my church. Look at look look at me. Look at the the. You know I understand you can spend a whole lot of money on a suit. I understand some of these guys have ten thousand dollar suits. Wow, what can I do with ten thousand? I got a hundred and fifty dollar suit, and I think that's too much. Maybe I just ought not to wear suits. The section, this is two real warnings here. The warning is against pride, the pride of the scribes. We get lifted up with pride. And in that, the thing that very, um, very much condemns us and, loses, and we lose uh, credibility. And we, we, isn't that exactly what had caused Satan to fall was his pride? He was lifted up. And, and we live in a day that that we have uh, that pride is a big big thing. You hear about it all the time, of one way or another. We're always lifting ourselves up. And and if you read Scripture real carefully, we don't need to lift ourselves up as followers of Christ. He'll do that for us. Psalm 100, uh, First Peter. I'm sorry. Psalm 1, First Peter 5. We'll talk about that. That in in your time, He will lift you up. We don't need to. He warns us against that pride. 
uh, we were talking in Sunday school, Eric and I remember, some of you guys may remember this. Uh, I'm using one of my old Bibles. Actually, it's an open Bible like I gave Blake for Sunday school. I got tired of bringing Bibles from place to place, so I'll put one in Sunday school. And I'll use it, and I've got plenty of them, and they're just sitting on my shelf collecting dust. But I opened up the Bible and said, hey, yeah, this one has, um, has a signature from, from Dr. Gray. And, and how many of you guys remember the day that, that when there would be a preacher come, you'd go up after the service and you'd take your Bible to them and they'd, they'd autograph your Bible? And you all ever ha- experienced that? Or is that just that little crowd that I ran with? I had somebody ask me to sign their Bible one time. I was a, a, on deputation to be a church planner in Gainesville, and he asked me to sign the Bible. I said, hey, man, you don't want my signature. I'm nobody big. You see how we create that. And, and, and you know when people start doing that, Corey was saying that somebody came to him, he goes, no, I don't want to do You know, that has a tendency to lift up your pride and you start do, building up and it becomes more about you. He's saying we need to warn, aware, and be aware of that. The other thing he did is he called them flat out thieves, which devours widows' houses and for a pretense, make long prayers. Devour, they're stealing from, wi- from widows. It, it, seems that, it seems that these scribes would often serve as estate planners for widows. And that gave them the opportunity to convince distraught widows that they would be serving God by supporting the temple or the scribes' own holy work. In either case, the scribe benefited monetarily and effectively robbed the widow of the husband's legacy to her. Does that sound familiar today? Listen, I, there was a little lady in, in, uh, in Sanford. Every time she saw a certain type of commercial, she would try to give to it. And she would give, and she was a widow, and she... <laughs> She didn't have much, and she got taken over and over and over by people supporting something that was just wasn't right. And, and, and I see these guys on television, and they're, they're just working people over for money. And they seem to target our older generation and, and, and widows, and they take the last things they have and they, for their own gain. That's wrong. That is so wrong. In fact, you know, if you read through the scripture, we're supposed to take care of widows and orphans. They were, these guys were so perverted in their worship. They wanted the money and they didn't take care of them. We've got to be careful we don't do that. Listen, I understand. Ministries need money. And I'm asking money for uh, a mission project. <clears throat> Let me say something to you, and, and we'll get a little bit more in the next section. If you can't afford to give, don't give. If you're a widow and you can't afford to give, only do what you can afford. And let us know so we can take care of the things that you need. James tells us that all religion, religion, pure religion, is taking care of widows and orphans. And we need to be about that, but sometimes we don't know the needs. But I... Do, Listen, I will, I do not, well, let's go to the next section so I can finish this thought. The widow's offering. And Jesus set over against the treasury, and behold, how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And he called unto his disciples, and he saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more, cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even her living. He's observing this. Now, I know that you heard this passage preached over and over again. How wonderful this widow was to give everything she had. And Jesus was really lifting her up. I'm not sure that's true. Um, I've always thought about this thing. And what are we doing in the context here? And, and just a few weeks ago, I was listening to John MacArthur on the radio as I was coming in, and he touched this. If you look at the context, Jesus has just got through talking about how bad the scribes are stealing money from widows. 
In the next section we're going to get into, he's going to talk about end times and how that temple is going to be destroyed. He has been condemning in this whole uh, last two passages the religious crowd. And I think what he's doing is he is condemning the religious practice that would, would make a widow throw in everything she had and hope that she could make it till the next time she got money so she could eat. I'm sure Jesus had compassion on that widow, but I don't think he was wanting us to act like that widow. You see, Israel had explicit laws on how to take care of widows, but they had worked their traditions around where they could steal from them. Don't let any preacher on television, any organization on television, guilt you in or make you think you're going to be better if you give everything you have and starve. That's not what Jesus would ever want you to do. This kind of makes me mad. I've seen so many people, <laughs> I've seen so many people hurt themselves because they thought I might get some special thing. And sometimes this very passage is used to, to make them feel like, if I give everything I have and I don't have anything else and, and I'll just trust God to, to take care of me, I don't think Jesus planned it that way. It doesn't really line up with any other scripture. And we'll talk about what it means to give in a little bit later. But let me caution you, don't, man, we live in a time of lots of thieves and robbers and, and, called, and they call themselves clergy. We need to stay away from that. We need to be back to this word of God. In fact, what we've seen exposed here is just nothing but rank hypocrisy. The hypocrisy of the, of the scribes, the, the hypocrisy of the, the Pharisees, the hypocrisy of the Sadducees, the, the chief priests, nothing but, but hypocrisy. And as believers in Christ, as followers of Jesus, we have got to avoid hypocrisy. So in the time we have left, let me kind of walk through some things to help us avoid hypocrisy. People lo love to say, I don't go to church because it's full of hypocrites. Well, they're a hypocrite too. And we all have hypocrisy, let's, let's face it. But we can avoid a lot of it if we will follow some of the steps I'm getting ready to talk about. First one, we can avoid hypocrisy by resting in the presence of the Messiah verses 35 to 37 Jesus is once again explaining that he is the Messiah he is the anointed one he will be the savior of all who trust in him and if you think about Jesus he if we just rest in his presence and we try to be like him could you ever point to any hypocrisy of Jesus going through the scriptures there was never hypocrisy we need to rest in his presence. Now, I know all, all the preacher says, and be careful. Even I will say stupid things sometimes. That's my family. They can tell you all sorts of them. They'll give you a list. All right, since you don't. <clears throat> we need to rest in the presence of the Messiah, and that means resting in the truth that Jesus is Lord. In Acts chapter 9, we have the story of, of Saul, who turned into Paul, and his... Um, his salvation experience you see he was out to destroy he was one of these hypocrites he was a pharisee he told himself he's the pharisee of the pharisees he had all these credentials he was learned he studied by Gamaliel he's the best he's the best guy ever man he was the prime teacher I mean that's like studying with John Cash at, at Trinity or, or who's the big guy at um at BBC who was the the, the do-all teacher at BBC Harnu or something like that. It was, you know, it was probably before you because I heard all these old guys my age, <laughs> the old guys, and Pastor Bales talk about this this one teacher out there that he was the he was the guy. Um, he had all Paul had, Saul had all the credentials, and he was out persecuting the church. And he's on his way to Damascus because he's got letters and permission to go persecute him and throw him in jail, and he could even kill him if he needed to. 
He was doing all this for the glory of God, and all of a sudden, Jesus stops him in the road to Damascus. He sees a vision. His horse, he falls off the horse, and listen to what his words say. It says, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? There was a preacher that I heard several messages from in, uh, while I was in Bible college. And uh, he, had a, he used this passage, and, and uh, he called it, he said uh, uh, the me- name of his message was, That's him. Saul realized that whoever this person was, was Lord, was God, that's him. And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. That was the start of, of that was the salvation of Saul, who became Paul, who wrote the, most of the New Testament, who planted churches everywhere, all because he recognized Jesus as Lord. Can I, can I tell you something? There are a lot of religious people who will name the name of Christ, but Jesus is not their Lord. I have kind of an experience with that. I had trusted Christ as my Savior, and uh, I was really happy about that. I'm going to heaven, right? But I had my own plans. I had a five-year goal plan. I was working for a, a, a sporting goods company. Man, listen, I'm 23, 20, 23, 24 years old, just out of the Air, Air Force. Got a job with a wholesale sporting goods company. We wrapped um, fishing tackle and dive equipment and water skis and 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 man, I got to go fishing with some of the the named big names of that day. And I hung out with pro water skiers in Orlando. And and I was, I mean, it was a great job. I made good money. Uh, I threw away good money too. But I had my plan. I was happy I was going to heaven. But but see, I just want to go sell sporting goods and have a great time. And that was my life. I just love to have a good time. And through that process, over this time that I'm trying to have a good time, God's trying to work on me to, to do what he really had for me to do. You see, he was my Savior, but he wasn't my Lord. And he worked to a place where he got me where I decided that, and I understood that Jesus was not only my Savior, but he is my Lord, and I need to follow whatever he says. If you're here this morning and, and you know Christ as your Savior, but you don't really live for him, he's not really your Lord, he's not who you check with before you do things, let me tell you something. Make him the Lord of your life. He will not steer you wrong. We were Yesterday we were in Gainesville, 30th anniversary of a church in Gainesville that, that uh, Pastor Bales started and then we came alongside later when i graduated bible college um i wanted to be a church planner i want to go someplace where there wasn't no churches and start a church and uh, we were going to go to maine augusta maine i'd never been to maine um yeah <laughs> dick's back there yeah hey, i heard there was no churches up there and and uh there are just several things and since already you know she's she's from up north, and she understood cold, and I just had a couple winters in Korea, and I figured, well, no, if God's there, we'll be fine, and Cynthia prayed us out of going to Maine. <laughs> she surrendered to go to Maine, but she prayed us out, and we ended up going to Gainesville. Gainesville, uh, where the University of Florida is, and, and don't, you Gator fans, don't go crazy. Um, I got it. I know. Um, I can tell bad things about the, the Gators, and we could get into that. We'll wait till Florida State game and Miami game, and then we'll we'll have some fun with that. Fun, it's not that serious a deal. We went to Gainesville, place where churches just died. In fact, there was a huge church there at one time, University Baptist Church. A guy was incredibly innovative. He had drive-in services before drive-in services were needed. Um, really cool building. 
there was a Christian school, and uh, we went there, and I walked through that place, and they were down from a huge complex to meeting in one room, getting ready to shut the church. I left a note. God's in the business of starting churches, not shutting them down. They didn't want anything to do with me. So we went to Gainesville. We are going to start a church. We couldn't find any place to meet, so we started visiting churches. So we visited this, this church plant. <laughs> Some of y'all will get it. I was not real smart. I didn't grow up in church. I didn't know about organizations. When I was in uh, uh, starting to, to raise money to go to Gaines, Gainesville, um, I heard about a guy, that uh, a BBF guy, that was planning a church there. I didn't know what BBF meant. But I called him, and I didn't get a hold of him. I got a hold of his son, Keith. That BBF guy turned out to be Pastor Bales. We went to the church. They were meeting in a school called Oak Hall. And uh, um, it was funny because the singing group from Trinity was coming, was there. And we showed up. And our kids had been bounced around from church to church to church. They loved it there. There was a couple college kids taking, doing kids' ministry. I think um, it was Bill and Paula. And Craig knows them. And Craig's son, Chase, was there. And uh, all of a sudden, I, I met Bill and Charlotte, and uh, we met them, and um, we had a, pretty much the same vision of what we wanted to do. And God joined us at that point in time. That's why I went, one of the reasons we went to, to Gainesville was to be mentored and loved and joined with Pastor Bales. And we became a great team, not only in Gainesville, but we, had a great, we became a great team here. And God's blessed our ministries. Not only that, when Bill came here, um, he recommended me for a church that didn't happen. They called another man in named Rick Chandler. And uh, he used us to bridge the gap between Rick and, and Bill. And Rick and Kay Chandler, some wonderful people. They were really young. And, um, and, and we were able to help them. And we had some, there was some normalcy. Our families got to be together. There was some normalcy. And I got to see them yesterday. There were some other families we had a, an impact on. And we were really only there, what, three years since then? Three, three years. And the other thing that we went to Gainesville for, why God put us there, was Shans. Gretchen started going to Shans. Her doctor, her immunologist, Dr. Sleesman, took her and helped fix her not permanently fixed she still struggles but he saved her life because the pulmonary guy said oh man she's got three four years and dr sleesman said ah nah we can we, we're going to take care of this when jesus is the lord of your life you can rest in the fact that he is lord if he directs you someplace you can know that there's reasons now, I still hadn't quite figured out the reason we went to, to Arkansas for a year and a half. Um, for me, that was the backside of the desert. But uh, we went, and then we came here. Maybe it was just, for, you know what, I think it may have been the fact I came back here as a youth pastor. I didn't want to be a youth pastor. After being in Arkansas, I'd love to be a youth pastor. <laughs> and it wasn't. And there's nothing wrong with the state of Arkansas. It was just the, 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 the situation we were in was difficult. But see, when Jesus is your Lord, when you're resting in the fact that he is the Lord, you can rest in the fact that what he does in your life will move you to the place you need to be. You can avoid hypocrisy by resting in Jesus. Oh, yeah, there's one more point there. I've got to fill the one. Rest in the fact, rest in the truth that Jesus will heal your soul. You go, why are you using that one before you talked about, about him being Lord? Because sometimes... Even as a believer, our soul needs to be touched. And Jesus is the one. He's the one that can restore our, whole, our soul. Not only does he give us salvation, he restores our soul. And then we can rest in the truth that Jesus gives us grace. Because that is exactly what we need, nothing but grace. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, and he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 
if we want to avoid hypocrisy, we need to live in the truth that Jesus is the Messiah and all that goes along with that. Secondly, if we want to avoid hypocrisy, we need to focus on inner spirituality rather than outward appearance. And he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces and the chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost rooms of feast. Man, we need to work on the inner spirituality, not on the outward look. Romans 12 Verse 1 and 2 says this, I beseech you, brethren, therefore by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and that acceptable and perfect will of God. You see, we, can't, we don't need to focus on the outward appearance. We need to focus on the inward man, the, in our hearts, our heart condition. Man, it's so easy to come up with a bunch of rules and regulations that if we can abide by that, that we look right, we say the right words, we have the right Bible, and it has to be big and, and you've got to hold it up like this so everybody can see it. If we have all that stuff together, we're spiritual. No, we're just like the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees when we do that. We have to be transformed. It's a heart issue. Ephesians tells us in, in Ephesians 4 that we are to put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. We are to put away those things that were behind us, those old things, the, the corrupt things, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness you see what you understand is jesus has given us all his righteousness all his holiness and we just need to live that out we need to let that settle in our hearts and quit trying to perform our way into some sort of way of pleasing god it's not performance that he looks at the heart i can go a long way with that but i don't want to i don't want to go too far and now i'm going to get in trouble because ladies i'm going to talk to you first peter three and, and says this. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. And this is what I'm getting at. Old, Whose adorning, let it not be that of outward adorning, of plaiting a hair and the wearing of gold and, or a putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. By the way, who had a meek and quiet spirit? Jesus. So what he's telling you is just be like Jesus. It's not about the outward appearance. It's the heart. It's not. Proverbs 31 Favor is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. 1 Timothy 2.9, In like manner also that women adore themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Okay, a couple things we need to say. Dress nice. Okay, it's not about, it, 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 he's not telling you you have to dress shabby. You see, I know people have taken that to an extreme, and, and, and women dress shabby, and, and that's not, the men all, they, <laughs> I hate it when I see these things happen. Men dress in their fancy suits, and they look, them, they look like peacocks strutting around, and the women are all in shabby clothes and not in stylish, and stop that stuff. That's not what God's talking about here. See, that's go back to the hypocrisy. I'm going to be so godly that I'm going to look like, no. We're to dress nice. We're to feel good. We're to, to take care of ourselves. But let, that's not the main thing that's out there. It's not like being a shiny person. You see those people that, that sometimes get up on stage in, the, in church and they, they're, they're, you know they're performing because it's not of the Holy Spirit because it's all about looking at me. He's saying, don't do that. Go to the heart. Great 
heart. You see, all that other stuff that we do, we either we're, 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 we're showing off all our stuff, that's hypocritical, or we're putting ourselves down into a mean area, that's hypocritical. we got to avoid hypocrisy, man. Let's just take care of the heart. Corey uh, preached a couple weeks ago, and uh, he said this. He said that we have to hate sin, and that's exactly right. And we need to hate sin. I, I believe that's a great de definition of holiness is when we hate sin. And by the way, I hate the sin I commit, and yes, I do. I'm not perfect. Far from it. Ask anybody that knows me even a little bit how imperfect I am. God, I can, it, it, you know, when I hate the sin of my, my sin, it drives me back to Jesus, to the grace that he gives. And, and then I can, I, I, you know, if we just hate our own sin, not try to cover it up, hate it. Let it drive you to the grace of Jesus. You know what? You're going to avoid some hypocrisy then. And when you do get to this place where where Man, you get called out as a hypocrite. Don't bow up and talk. Ask forgiveness. Isn't that what Jesus taught us in Matthew 18 when we, when we mess up that we are to ask forgiveness? Please, please forgive me. Hard. It's hard to call someone a hypocrite when they're begging for forgiveness and when they admit their sin. See, we have got to avoid hypocrisy. Last point, we avoid hypocrisy by giving ourselves to the Lord. Really, that kind of sums it all up. Here's the story. We're back to the treasury and the, the widow. She cast in everything she had. Everything she had. All of her substance, it says. That could mean that she cast it all in and she was going to go home and die. And we've already addressed the fact that we don't, that's not what the Bible teaches about giving. But the Bible does teach that we are to give of ourselves to the Lord. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Romans 12, 1 refers all the way back when it says, therefore, all the way back to Romans chapter 1, where it starts exposing the sin. And then it starts exposing the, the grace of God and the, the answer for sin and, and, and how God is going to move things through. And we get to this place because of everything God has done for us, it only makes sense that we give him back our bodies, our reasonable service. Some, way, some people will translate that the logical worship. That word reasonable is the word logizomai. I love that Greek stuff. I paid too much to take that class so many times. I've got to use it, okay, folks? If, I know you may not like it, but it's, I got to, you know, it, it, I got to be a good steward of all that money I spent. We get the word logic from that. Isn't it only logical that, that for all that Jesus has done for us, that we just serve him? Doesn't that just make sense? It should. It should. Present your body as a living sacrifice. You see, under the old covenant, God accepted sacrifices uh, of dead animals. But when Jesus came, he gave the ultimate sacrifices. Old Testament sacrifices weren't needed anymore. They're, they, they're, you can see Hebrews 9. But for us who are in Christ, this only acceptable worship is to offer ourselves completely to him. So what does that mean? Does that mean you've got to work yourself? Dennis used to say you, you worked at a church that uh, would win them, wet them, work them, and waste them. Whew. Been there too. Guilt people into doing all sorts of things. Listen, there are lots of places for you to serve God. Within, this, within the walls here, over there, whether it's being a greeter at the door, helping Mike out, um, whether it's helping serve coffee or bring food, I gather we're doing that again. So y'all y'all getting your little breakfast times now? None of that food's healthy for me, so it was really good. It, I, it was great that when we didn't have that, I wasn't tempted to go eat that sweet stuff. <clears throat> I'm trying to stay away from over there now. I see a, is that a chocolate donut? 
Well, as soon as you'll have that one done before. Look. Reasonable. Logical. In light of all the spiritual riches believers enjoy, just because God is so merciful to us, it is logically follows that we give them our highest form of service. Whether that be financial giving, whether that be giving of your time, whether that be giving of your talents, we have all of those things. Some have great musical talents. Use it for the Lord. I'm not sure what all my talents are. I'm just trying to, everything I can do, I'll just give it to him. If you're blessed financially, you can give financially. Just follow what God tells you to do. <clears throat> if you're willing to, to sit in the nursery with a kid or, or, or to be somebody that, that just kind of manages the, the um, chaos in a kid's ministry, Go do that. Whatever you can do. We're going to be starting up our senior adult ministry in, the, uh, in August. And we will, we're, going to, we're going to kick some things in gear. I'm already trying to set up a, a trip to um, uh, the children's home up in Tampa for, for, uh, <coughs> excuse me, for September. Um, now that we have that really nice bus that um, the Seminoles gave us, um, it, it'll be more pleasant trips. Maybe you can help somebody there. Maybe you can help at the football game. There's, everybody has something they can do to serve the Lord. Maybe it's just praying and loving. We've got people that come in here and pray. We need prayer. Whatever God lays on your heart, just go be obedient and do it. We're going to need some more workers for Good News Club. Look, I, I can lay out thing after thing after thing. The thing, the, the, really what I want you to do is to understand that we need, it only makes sense because of what Jesus, that we give back to him. We give back to him. You know what that'll look like? Romans 12, just going down a little bit further, starting verse 9 says this. Let love be without dissimulation. And hoard that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love, and honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, Give him drink, for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. You see, that's a description of a believer who's not a hypocrite. If we follow that, we'll avoid hypocrisy. Romans also, same chapter, incredible chapter, says this. For I say, verse 3, For I say through the grace given unto me that every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. It also goes on then to give all the different types of gifts. Every one of you have at least one gift, maybe more. Some of you are super talented in lots of ways. Use what God has given you. Humble yourself. Live out the grace that God Christ has given you, and we will avoid hypocrisy and glorify our Lord. If you're here and you never trusted Christ, probably most everything I said doesn't make a whole lot of sense to you. Let me give you the one message that you do need. 
Jesus Christ died on a cross, was buried, and he rose again to take away your sin. And we're all guilty of that. You can either try to pay for it, or can you let the only one who can pay for it do that? That's Jesus. He gave his all so that we could be made right with God. If you've heard me, you never trusted me. I am, I'll use Paul's language, I beseech you to trust Jesus as your Savior today. Admit you're a sinner, believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and ask him to forgive your sins and be your Savior. If you're a believer, let's rest in the Lord. Let's trust him. Let's avoid hypocrisy. And let's work on the inner man to be holy. So we can be the salt and light that this world needs. Just let you know, we're not going to go straighten out the world. But we will influence and impact many people when we are living out the Lord Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, as we uh, come this morning, we know that hypocrisy is the, the one thing that just so, so destroys a church, destroys and, and, and puts a, a black mark on your people. Help us to avoid that. And Lord, when we catch ourselves in those hypocritical times, help us to confess that sin to you, to make reparation to the people we've hurt. And Lord, help us, oh Lord, help us to live out, live out the Lord Jesus so others can see and they can know that there's, there's hope for them. Father, if there's someone here and they've not trusted you, I pray that even right now they will look to you and place their faith in, your, in the death, burial, and resurrection of your son. And Lord, help us as your people to be a blessing to each other. And Lord, to those who are outside who need to know the truth. Help us to honor and glorify you in all that we do. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a song. Y'all stand up. We're going to sing. And uh, <laughs> I'm not real good at this invitation thing. Um, let me just, just not one of those things I do well because I don't want to try to twist people's arms to come make, get on the, their knees and all this. You know what's going on in your heart. Holy Spirit is working in your heart. My challenge, be obedient to that. Okay? I don't need to come back here and twist your arm. I don't want to do that. that I, I think that goes back to some of those hypocrisy. Just be brave enough to do what the Holy Spirit has asked you to do. You know in your heart. Follow that. Let's sing. Hold to Jesus, I surrender. Hold to Him, I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily.
Jesus, take me now. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Have a seat for just a second, if you would, please. Um, we have welcomed Blake in, and he came in. He's going and doing. We forgot to do something. He's not officially a member of our church. He's probably still a member of Trinity. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So Blake is coming on transfer a letter from Trinity Baptist Church back to Sunshine. Now, he's been a member here before, but now he's back as a member. So if you would rejoice in that, say amen. 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 Come give him a hug and let him know that you're happy he's here. We love him. Amen. Now you can be dismissed. took his wife and her child and they went to Africa to escape the rage of a dead man. 